последният настан за Вичева на фестивал от Букстър. Повторно Биляна Цървинковска и Александър Маджаровски како модератори на овој настан. Ги имаме, само да споменам дека ги зборуваме на английски, за да можеме да бидеме малко по, да речам, да можеме повеќе да се внесеме во дискусијата. So we will speak in English. And we have our guests here. So I will start with, we have our guest, this is Kristina Gavran from Croatia and uh, Bogdan Alexander Stranescu from Romania. Uh, I will uh, tell you, uh, I'll tell you a few words about uh, Christina Gavran. She is a writer, uh, playwright and uh, I don't know how to translate this Dramski Pedagog. Uh, <laughs> uh, she writes uh, plays and short and long prose uh, and she also um, she's also conducting creative uh, workshops uh, creative creative writing and uh, acting or something a tv so was for children and adults and uh, her novel uh, Gitara of Papi Sander uh, was recently published uh, by Antolog uh, and translated in Macedonian by Vladimir Jankovsky. All right, so let me say a few words about Bogdan. Um, um, we were chatting before and I asked him, uh, do you go by uh, Bogdan Alexandru Stanescu? And you told me, all right, there was another famous uh, German priest or yeah, there's a guy working for the national television who has the same name. Yeah, so when Alexandru we usually collide, collide, you know. <laughs> so, so Alexandru helped uh, to have as a middle name to make a differentiation. Yes. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, uh, Bogdan Stanescu is a Romani It comes from, he comes from Romania. He's a writer. He has a big experience as a translator too and as an editor of, uh, and I read some of the biography of some serious, serious novels and we were chatting and uh, some very serious uh, European and world uh, writers he has translated and he has edited uh, their books and uh, in Macedonian translation we can read his book uh, The Childhood of Kaspar Hauser it's a very interesting book, we'll discuss a little bit about that so you're very welcome, and uh, this will, I will mainly uh, speak uh, to Bogdan and uh, Bilal. This will be a cross-examination. Yes. <laughs> this, right. this will be uh, separated by, by gender strictly, <laughs> but we'll have one uh, or two uh, common, common joint questions, questions, yes. joint questions in the end. So will you start or do you want me to? Uh, you, you yeah. Start. Okay, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, um, about uh, Guitar of Palisander, it's a rosewood actually, as uh, rosewood. Alexander told me. Uh, I wrote some, uh, I read somewhere that uh, um, it was defined that this is a novel about uh, female emancipation. Um, it, I, I might agree with that, but for me, it was um, mostly a novel about female principle, about about this uh, female power, and uh, even uh, it uh, reminded me of uh, this uh, goddess mother and the this all powerness of of birth cycle, death, and rebirth. Uh, can you tell me something more about this and about the creation of this novel? Thank you. Uh, right, so when I read the title of the panel and it, it included history as the word, I was a little bit surprised why is my book put in a panel that talks about history. 
Because one thing that uh, often critics and people say, like, we are very surprised that you don't write about historical moment or political moment uh, in, you know, Balkans or, or post-war situation. Um, so the story of guitar of Palisander follows five women, but for four of them, we actually don't know, uh, we can't place them geographically, and we even can't place them in the time. Uh, so if you read the novel, you will see it's all mythological, it's all captured in a story. Uh, you have a little bit of sense of Spain and India, um, maybe, you know, like, but actually you don't know where they're placed up until we come to the fifth woman, uh, Petra, and she lives in Zagreb and she's the modern woman and so on. Um, and yes, I was very much inspired by storytelling. Uh, so at the moment when I, when I was writing this book, I started doing my PhD in storytelling. Um, and my PhD was in true life storytelling, so a little bit different, but uh, just as a kind of, you know, literature review that you have to do at the beginning, I read quite a lot of folk stories and mythology. And uh, I just noticed how much, you know, we are all raised on fairy tales, and there is always a problem that <laughs> that little girls listen to those Disney type of fairy tales where women are beautiful and kind and nice, yeah. <laughs> but actually they don't have any power. For Prince Charming. <laughs> waiting for Prince Charming. Yeah. But actually, the original fairy tales that come from folk, folk tales, that, that come from, you know, it's oral transmission of those stories. In those stories, women are much more powerful and I wanted to capture that. I wanted to put that in my novel. And for me, it's amazing that uh, Vladimir Jankowski translated this, this novel because so often people tell me like, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a book for women only. <laughs> and I don't agree with that. No, no, I don't um, agree with that too. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you, Alexander. Um, I think this, this powerful woman is almost raised from the stories that we listen, and it just needs to be brought back. So I hope I achieved it with my novel, at least a little bit. Yeah, you, you returned the matriarchal <laughs> moment <laughs> back. And I think, you know, I, I could do that better through, through those magical stories, rather than writing about the kind of struggles of contemporary women, and uh, to write like a very feminist novel, I was just not interested in that. I, I really wanted to look deep into into the stories of of goddess, of mothers, of of miscarriage, of taking care of uh, children, uh, of being an old witch. What does that mean in a story? Um, yeah. So those were the topics that were kind of intriguing me. Before I ask Bogdan a question, uh, it, for me your book was a. Uh... I take the liberty to comment. Uh, it was a breath of fresh air because too often, recently, we read books which are very auto-reflective and psychological, and you know they're very heavy topics sometimes. You know, a free uh, stream of consciousness, and they can burden us down. And for me, it was like a reading like a fairy tale, you know, out of time and space, and I, I really enjoyed it thoroughly. So Bogdan. Um, when I when I read your book and you know I opened and I read the, I was intrigued by the title. I said, "Oh, Caspar Hauser, who is Caspar Hauser?" And then I was I reading I was reading the book and there is no guy who is called Caspar Hauser in the book in the novel. I was like, and then I'm I'm like that and I immediately googled and I was like, "Who is Caspar Hauser?" So can you tell? And I think you played smart with that. I, I liked it. What is the story behind the story with, with the title, with the Hasper Hauser. Is there any connection, inspiration? Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is a connection and um, the story behind the story is a very long story, but mm -hmm. I will make it short. Uh, it's, uh, in 2016 I, I won a Traduki residency in Kosovo, in Pristina. Uh, of course, you know that you have to apply with a, with a project to get a residency, and my project was to write um, a critical monography of, uh, of an unknown literary critic, Romanian literary critic, who used to be one of the uh, heavy communists in the 50s. 
And this guy was uh, a very paradoxical figure because he he fought for uh, for communism. He almost got um, executed. The the sentence was turned in within two minutes before he was shot. And then he of course came into power, and he uh, he helped uh, instate the uh, socialist realism in Romania. But he was uh, an avid reader of Proust and Joyce. Okay, so he was fighting for literature about the peasants and the uh, the workers, yeah. But he was enjoying Proust and Joyce. And uh, in the 60s, he was uh, pushed away because he was not a big fan of Ceausescu, considering him not to be a real communist. He actually said that Ceausescu is a right-wing guy. He's uh, closer to a Nazi than a real communist. So after they pushed him away, he started uh, writing real criticism, using his Proust and Joyce, and writing uh, splendid novels. Okay, that was a long detour, sorry for that. <laughs> so, uh, there I was in Pristina, within a program called Pristina Has No River, uh, trying to, to write about this guy, and in the evenings, uh, watching movies. Uh, and I started watching all the, the movies by Werner Herzog. And Herzog has a movie called uh, The Enigma of Kaspar Hauser. Uh, now getting to Kaspar Hauser. Uh, the real case of Kaspar Hauser is that this young guy in his 20s shows up at the beginning of the 19th century in Nuremberg. He doesn't know who he is. He has this uh, note saying that his name is Kaspar Hauser. He's carrying a note on him. And he says, I've been raised up to this age in a cellar underground by an unknown person. He learned me how to speak, he fed me, and I was, you know, sleeping on straws. Then he gets murdered. This is Kaspar Hauser. So I, I watched this movie and I was trying to, to write about the literary critic and uh, I realized that I could be Kaspar Hauser. Uh, because I had this story in mind about a, uh, a child coming from a dysfunctional family, uh, not seeing his father, being raised by stepfathers and so on. But after that I realized that Romania could be Kaspar Hauser. Because Romania was raised in a cellar for almost 50 years, and then in a bigger cell for another 30 years. So I started telling the story of myself as a child, and then of Romania as a child, and uh, that's it. Interesting, thank you. It satisfies my, satisfies my curiosity. <laughs> Okay, back to Pristina, uh, because you already mentioned the fairy tales and myths that influenced you. Uh, this is my next question, actually, it's about how much these childhood stories have influenced you in your work. I'm not uh, speaking now only about Gitara od Palisander, but also about your place and your other, other work. How much these fairy tales have formed you as a person? Because you play with genres perfectly, you make uh, uh, real. You you uh, uh, you can uh, you you master the art of storytelling, but also the the art of making fantasy stories. So. Can you tell us, please, a little bit about that? I actually have a story about stories that I used to perform um, on stage of these storytelling clubs in England. And I start the story by saying that the biggest gift that the parent can give to their child is to every single night before bedtime to tell them a story. And not just parents, but also grandparents and aunts and uncles you know, it's like great that you buy toys and bring chocolates, but that cannot compare with telling stories. And I was very lucky that I had a couple of members of my family who were telling me stories. And what was great is that each one of them had a very unique style. So my mom would read a story. She was comfortable, you know, going to the library, uh, reading different fairy tales and so on. 
But my dad had a different approach and he would invent stories on the spot. <laughs> so like based on what happened that day, he would just create a story. He was very imaginative and crazy in his stories. And then I had grandma who was telling me more like folk tales and some stories from her childhood. And my grandfather, he was exclusively telling us true life stories. And we really, oh, it's me and my three siblings, so four of us, it's a big audience. <laughs> and we really enjoyed those true stories because we could learn a little bit more about the, the history of our family, but also, you know, how people used to live a long time ago. And um, then my grandfather got Alzheimer. And I could really feel how his stories are dismantling and he would lose the thread, he would forget some things, um, he would forget words in the middle of his sentence. And um, I, just, I just felt like it, it's so important to capture these stories because he died when I was 16 and many of his stories I forgot. But you know, still like that, that feeling, I think it stays with you forever. The, the stories that you listen as a child, even if you can't repeat them later on, but they influence my writing, they influence me as a person, they influence everything that I do. So I think I was very, very lucky that I had this variety of stories in my life. So okay. back to, um, we were talking about um, story is history and history is story and um, uh, your novel is definitely situated in a time and space and it covers basically the transition between the, those 50 years before in the bigger cell and the, some of the you know after that some of those years and I think you know if you think about history basically History is not just uh, big and great events, but it's many little subjective personal histories. And I think we find that in your, uh, and, of, and I assume, and I think there is auto-fictional moments and autobiographical moments. What did you, when you were writing this novel, did you have the idea that you want to portray a certain time, certain period, and put it as a testament? as a witness of a time, in a book, through a personal story? No. Actually, I, I wanted to, to paint the portrait of a city. And mm, that's, uh, that's what I had in mind. I mean, Bucharest was in my mind. Mm -hmm. Because I was totally dissatisfied of how Bucharest does not appear in Romanian fiction. The, this changed in the last five years. But when I started to write the book, nobody was uh, actually giving us Bucharest as it is, as a, uh, a mixture of melancholy and uh, sadness and ugliness and beauty at the same time. So the main character I think is Bucharest here. Uh, but then, as you said, you don't uh, come out, you don't spawn out of nothing into nothing. You are born into history even if you don't uh, admit it at the moment, but you understand it afterwards you understand history afterwards, so I think my generation is mature enough, not to say old, <laughs> to speak about the, the years of the revolution, of before the revolution and after the revolution, of the mystery of, the, of what happened then. So this is a huge subject for me and I'm, I try to explore it more in my uh, uh, most recent novel. But uh, here I was playing between short stories and novel and playing with history. I was playing a lot. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not a serious book, but uh, it's playful at the same time. Um, yeah, there is a history with a small age. There is history with a capital H as well. Mm -hmm. So if you know how to balance these two, maybe you'll discover things about yourself, mm -hmm. about what happened to you, what happened to your family, why were some decisions uh, taken at that moment. Mm -hmm. And about Romania as well. Mm. And what happened? To mention, you have an interesting approach to to your book and to your novel, which is not a totally linear story, like a, some kind of building from a or something, but it's more of a, a scenes or periods of of the life of the protagonist from a different time, which comprise 
one story. You still know that it's a one story, but from different periods, and you can see. Uh, and I like how you did that. You know, scenes from from the childhood, and there is. And and now when you mention that, okay, I see. Like, okay, that's a book rest from one period, and then from present, and from a transition. So I think you played really well how how that works. So they're not because sometimes people write novels which are basically short stories but with a thin thread you know and then you're like okay this could be like a short story connection but you have played they can function as short stories but still there is a strong feeling that they are one novel yes it's a, it's one novel because it actually presents the uh, the evolution of one character of this narrator who uh, is not a a, a coming of age novel it's uh, the portrait of a self destructive man yeah uh, described in parallel with the self-destruction of his country. Mm. Can I just, uh, before you go, avoid some uh, small question. I had the feeling, correct me if I'm wrong, that we have, the we have the character and he lives in not a pleasant situation, you know, like a broken family and everything. And I had, I had this feeling that this, how the surroundings of that messy period sometimes, messy neighborhoods, or can affect a child to grow into certain, unwanted in a way, to grow in a certain way. And it's stronger than us, it's environment forming us. Do you, you know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong, <laughs> not at all. Yeah, because yeah, nowadays we talk a lot about trauma, about, you know, what... Uh, there's a motto at the beginning of the book from, taken from Philip Larkin, which goes like that, they fuck you up, your mom and dad. But mom and dad here can be Romania, can be history, and it's not only about mom and dad. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you cannot grow uh, as a mature person when you are, you know, stepped on during your childhood. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's good. Okay. Um, um, I agree with all the critics that say that Guitar Out Police Thunder is a very well structured novel. Uh, how much your experience in playwriting has uh, helped you in building this structure? Because my belief, uh, I know that many writers will be mad now at me, but uh, my belief is that uh, only people that know how to write plays or screenplays can build uh, so detailed and good structure as you managed to do in Guitar of Pavisander and that they can play with uh, all these uh, um, catches in the story that uh, join together in the end uh, to give uh, a very very well uh, finale uh, and also I believe that uh, this filmic uh, atmosphere, you, you, when you read uh, this novel, you feel like almost you read some screenplay and you can, you can imagine it uh, in a movie. So, how much this experience of play playwriting helped you? So, I studied dramaturgy uh, at the Academy of uh, Dramatic Arts in Zagreb. And that's purely because um, that was the only uh, only faculty where you could study creative writing. So you can't study creative writing anywhere else in Zagreb, so it has to be playwriting. And we had playwriting and screenwriting, so you could kind of choose, and I, I chose um, playwriting. And I remember how our professors used to tell us, it was um, five students on my year, so it's very, like, you know, it's a small group. And we all wanted to be so experimental and new and be very like brave in our writing. And our professors were constantly saying like, no, learn the rules first. Uh, follow the footsteps of people who used to write before you. Learn the structure, learn the dialogue, the characters, and then break the rules. And you know, when you're young, you don't want to follow their rules. You really want to experiment and like feel like you are original. And then you read Pirandello and UNESCO and you're like, oh, shit, <laughs> somebody did it before me, like, I'm not original at all. And then you go back to, I don't know, antics and, and you really study the rules and you understand how sometimes the rules 
make you even more creative. And something about what you said, uh, Bogdan, is that you know when uh, when you have this like political pressure as well, like when when you are stepped on as a child, you kind of learn how to how to use your imagination and how to be very creative. You, you, you almost like you even learn how to lie, how to kind of you know like go around the rules. And I sometimes think that the the art that is created in oppressive societies can be much more creative than when you have all the freedom to do whatever you want. Um, I took this rigid structure for my novel, kind of following uh, the structure of of music, because I feel like you know you have the five lines. Um, and, and you have the, oh, I don't know the English words for these, like, I don't know the, the, the music language. Uh, but when you, when you read the partitura, it, it, score, thank you, um, it, it's very structured. And yet, inside, there is a whole chaos. There is, you know, there is playfulness, um, there is the atmosphere, emotion, and it kind of shows you that music is very mathematical. It's always the same numbers inside each of the, of the lines. And um, yeah, I kind of felt like, okay, if I have a very strict structure and I had it from the beginning, I, you know, I, I drew it on a paper, then I can be playful inside. Uh, so the structure was giving me kind of the lead, but that didn't mean that I didn't have the freedom. I would like a short question. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> about the, the, the writing. So you have the stru structure in your head before you start, yeah? Yeah, not in my head. I had to really write it down yeah, here. Yeah, but you, you have it. Yeah. And do you have the routine as well? In writing? Yeah. No. <laughs> you don't? <laughs> no. No, I was writing this novel when, uh, uh, when I had a small kid. Um, so, yeah, I think that maybe that's as well why structure helped because then it was very easy to come back to it um, and I do use like what you said like the, the, the kind of feeling of short stories um, even in my second novel um, which is coming out at the end of this month which is called Between I use fragments because that's the only way I can write at the moment. Uh, maybe when my kids are older I will write completely differently but now you know my time is just uh, and I, you know, I don't want to be ashamed of that. I don't want to like hide it. I kind of feel that's the, that's the the, the woman's power to to write in that way, and uh, and it's fine. Like I, at the moment, I think in fragments. I write in fragments, and uh, yeah, that's how I work at the moment. I don't know. After I read uh, your book, I would uh, uh, read anything you write until your children grow. You know, in between. <laughs> I trust you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to change the topic a little bit because uh, Bogdan uh, uh, is an experienced editor and we hear a lot about translation, translators, which are, I sometimes I tell the publishers a good translator is a pure gold. If, if it's a good, you need to uh, cherish them, pay them a lot of money, keep them. <laughs> <laughs> in an ideal world, you know. Uh, but um, what I don't see much in Macedonian publishing is uh, editing. I think it's not our strongest. Publishers, don't get me wrong, that's my impression. Because I, I, pre I, I follow what's going on in the scene, I read a lot of books, and I think especially uh, authors who are not translated, uh, so, what is your experience with that, and how is the situation in Romania, and how much the, the vanity of the author, let's say there is a Romanian author, uh, plays uh, into that? And when you have authors who say, oh no, you cannot intervene in my... What is the whole situation, your experience with that? Uh, luckily, I have no experience with Romanian authors. I uh, always worked on translations. Uh, because I'm, uh, I know what you're saying, I'm afraid of that vanity. <laughs> so, you know, you cannot argue with Salman Rushdie over the email, you know, he cannot come to you and tell you, you know, don't change a word in my translation. <laughs> but you do argue with translators. Uh, there are translators who uh, tell you from the beginning, you don't change a word in my translation. 
and you do it behind their backs. <laughs> this will stay in this room, okay? Uh, stop recording. What happens in Mokutsu stays in Mokutsu. So yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful job, but at the same time it's very difficult and very stressful. You know, when I tell people that being an editor is really stressful, they don't believe me. So starting with, I don't know, auctioning for, a, for an author and, you know, going up to the, uh, the design of the cover, it's, uh, it's a job that's uh, eating you alive. 80% mm. uh, of the translations are far from being perfect. So if uh, someone needs to be praised here, is the editor, not, not me, not my job, but the editor, the actual, uh, the, the guy who does the actual editing. I only read the PDF, the final PDF, and I have the final um, alterations of the text. Mm. Uh, so he's the unknown soldier, if you want. Yes, yes. <laughs> Christina wanted to ask. I have a question, if you don't mind. Did you work with an editor on your book? And how was that process with you? Especially because you know it from the other side. Was it hard or you accepted? Then, by the way, thank you for stealing my next question. <laughs> we we <laughs> worked together as a team. No, I'm joking. Yeah, I, I worked with, uh, with an editor and uh, she was so good that, you know, I insist every time that I publish something with uh, that publishing house that I work only with her. So I agree to postponing the publication. I agree to anything not being paid, that's a joke, uh, only to work with her. So she is my perfect uh, reader, she's and, the first reader. And the editor in you, when you look at your novels, was it, he was, was the editor in you, you were like, you were like okay, I could have changed this, or you don't read, so because some writers don't read ever their novels after they're out. Oh no, I, I hate reading it after it's out. It's, okay. You know that story, with, uh, the story with uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez going to Paris and he forgot to, to get any reading material with him, but he only had a copy of, uh, of his own book because he had to read in a, in a bookshop and he read it, entirely read it and it was covered in green when he arrived in Paris, all of it. Yeah, he said I would have written it differently. So it's better not to go yeah. there. <laughs> Good, thank you. I wanted to ask Christina about her editor and how is the process of the work. I am so grateful to have an editor, honestly, because um, when I was a student, you always have a professor, mentor, supervisor who is reading your work, giving you lots of advice and so on. And then you graduate and you go out to the world and you are lost, like all of a sudden there is no help, there is nobody who will read my work and give me some useful feedback, and there comes the editor. I mean, we just finished just today, the they sent my book to print, and we were just making some small changes in the morning, when editor really spotted some, you know, like for example, I mentioned um, second marriage anniversary, he's like, this is not second, this is first, and you're like, oh my god, or... You know, like, or you read over and over something that is completely wrong, or a phrase that is wrong, but they spot it. I don't know how they have these, like, magical eyes that just, like, scan everything. And, yeah, it, it's just so useful to have an editor. Yeah, you should, like, always keep your editor next to your side. Except you when you're, you are your own editor. Yeah. <laughs> there is a competition between the two of you. <laughs> yeah, who will ask more questions? No, actually, I was going to be so kind now and say, Miliana, would you like to... Because I think slowly we're going to try to wrap up the conversation and then we have one more serious uh, question and then I will do one more in the end. This is now a really, really serious, serious question for both of you. Um, do you feel that there is some kind of... Uh, uh, I'm trying to, to translate my own words now. Progress, Do you think that yeah, some kind of progress uh, when it comes to translating and promoting the works of what Europe says lesser languages? That, that, that those are our, our languages. Uh, and uh, outside of the borders of your own countries. And do you see a progress here, and do you see some kind of regress in your own country when it comes to uh, widening the audience, since the younger readers 
I'm now reading more and more English literature and uh, English language literature and there are even more speaking English. So what are your experiences here? I I am very grateful to the European Literature Award because just because I was put in the finals, all of a sudden some other publishers found out about my book. Otherwise, I don't think that Jarko and Valentina would ever even know that my book existed. So it kind of puts you on a map of European literature. And that's why I got the Macedonian translation, Bulgarian translation, the French translation is also in preparation. So yeah, these kind of awards, they do help. I, I got some national awards, in, but you know, they mean in Croatia, outside of Croatia. Nobody knows what is Marin Držić award or Marko Marulić or Slavic. It's just, um, yeah, it, it's a problem. Um, I live in England for, for the last nine years and, you know, I'm really trying to bring my work to England and it's, it's really, really hard because they just read their own literature. And sometimes it's a blessing to be born in a small country that uses that has a small language because if you just compare the books that we have to read as part of our high school education, I mean we read wide, like we read from Italy to South America to Russia to, you know, like it, it was all part of the curriculum. When they, they don't, they're not exposed to it, they're not exposed to translations, they watch the television only in English, they read the magazine, they listen to music. For us it was just, I don't know, I think we, we are used to many languages and many stories and, you know, like, okay, even if I read a book translated, but still there are names that don't sound like names from my own country and I think that openness exists here, but not so much over there. Um, sorry, I forgot the second part of the question. The About younger audiences that uh -huh. read... Um, I think just that the literature has to adjust to how and what young audience needs and I don't think that old writers can adjust to that, they should just continue writing how they write and the young audiences will bring young writers who just write in a different way. And sometimes when I read books from really young authors like 22 years old, they are interested in different topics, they, they write in a different style and that's how it has always been the history of literature and I'm open to it and maybe sometimes I will not understand it completely but that is fine and uh, you know I think also we have to learn from them and um, some, some of the stories that I read you know they can shock me and um, I could be like not prepared for them but they are part of the, the whole conversation so rather than saying like oh they should read us I would rather say, okay, how can we read them? Oh, I don't know what to say. It's, uh, you know, this translation thing is, um, it's like a, a sword, you know, it's with uh, uh, two faces of the, of the same coin. Um, in Romania, we, we complain about not being uh, translated. But we don't translate, you know, we translate 80% Anglo-Saxon literature, then we some French, some German, uh, Spanish, Spanish is uh, growing. Uh, but we still complain, you know, you have to give in order to get. So, <laughs> uh, I, I was in Bul Bulgaria in, uh, this summer in, in Plovdiv and there were so many Romanian writers translated in Bulgarian. And on the Romanian market right now you can find two, two or three names, you know. So that, that's a shame, you know, but it's not the audience's fault. I mean, uh, you as a, as a publisher, as an editor, have this function of uh, educational function. You are not uh, in charge only of satisfying the demand. You should go to Bazaar then, if you want to do that. You have to create the taste. You have to give a different product and taste the, the, test the market. So uh, it's uh, the biggest surprise of last year in my collection was Gergi Gospodinov, the Bulgarian author who nobody translated in Romania, even though he was translated in 30-something countries. You know, why? Why don't you want to read this very 
uh, interesting, brilliant uh, Bulgarian author. He's like uh, a few kilometers away from you. Is that that's almost like uh, a wall, you know? The closer they are, the bigger the wall. That's a paradox. So I would start by talking about us. Why don't we translate more, you know? And then uh, complain about not being uh, translated enough. Yeah. And about the young uh, uh, the readership. It's, my book was very successful with teenagers. But yeah, and I can understand why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand also, but that's uh, probably a rather rare phenomenon than the, the rule, you know what I mean? Yeah, I understand why teenagers would love your novel. It's, um, for us, I'll, 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 this is a small comment, for us it's, uh, in Macedonia it can be uh, challenging because we are a small market, small nation, and we don't have transla uh, translators for many languages. So then we have to have a double trans, you know, uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, I see your point. And by the way, Gary Gospodinov he has a pretty good following here, and almost everything that he has published uh, is translated in Macedonia. He's very popular here, so... Yeah, as, as a writer, as a Bulgarian writer, he has a pretty good uh, readership here. All right, shall we have one more, like... Usually that's a cliche uh, question, but let's go for it anyway. Uh, what are you working on now? And what are your <laughs> what are your plans for the future, near future? I just stopped working today on my uh, second novel. It's called Between uh, Izmeju, and it's a fragmented story of a couple who moves from Zagreb to Birmingham, so from Croatia to England, and uh, their constant struggle to fit in, but also the the feeling of losing connection to their home as well and their culture and their language and everything else and I decided to tell it over a period of 10 years because I noticed how much this migration changes you are very different when you just arrive in the country and you are this like newcomer and everything is exciting or everything is horrible and then you slowly adjust and your migrating experience changes completely and yeah, throughout the book they're just asking themselves, should we stay and build a community here and put roots here or should we go back mm. because we miss our home too much? Good. I'm not going to tell you how it ends. All right. <laughs> well, I, I just published my uh, latest novel in uh, March this year and it's a 620 pages long novel, so I deserve a break. And uh, I promised myself that this year I will only translate. And I translated a book of memoirs by uh, Philip Roth, uh, a book of memoirs by um, Paul Oster. Both of them are about the death of their father. Don't ask me how I chose the books. Uh, they chose me. And I just signed a contract to translate a huge seminar by uh, Carl Gustav Jung about Nietzsche's Zarathustra. It's 1,600 pages long. But I started writing a new novel. <laughs> In all of that, uh, I don't know what what it's going to be about, but certainly it's going to be about the the job of uh, translator <laughs> and how it can uh, uh, be a curse <laughs> to a, to a human being and uh, how it can uh, give birth to schizophrenia because you. For a while, you stop uh, thinking for yourself. You have to think like that, that guy, and uh, write like him and feel like him. And this is maybe not a very good way of living. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed this conversation. I thank you for coming to Bookstar. I wish you success with your writing process, translation, and all the future books and. Please uh, let's give our thanks with a big applause for and applause for, for the moderators. They, they are the heroes. Today.